Kerikoto welcome back to another edition of Big Hairy News. How are we? How are we? How are we? How are you, Chewy? Hi, I, I am a. I, I think today a a, a medium. A medium you're, today. You're a medium. Medium good. Yeah. I like medium well. That's my stakes. Medium, medium, medium rare. Thanks. <laughs> That's how I. No, I, no, I it's just just a little bit of a down buzz day, but um. I, I am sitting here half in a sleeping bag, a fuzzy hat on. It's all right. Things are can okay. I, can I give you a bit of an upper? This, well. You'll so. feel good about this. You ready for this? Yeah. Um, so whilst I was getting ready for the show, preparing in my studio, I just had on on my big TV. I've got it like within about a metre and 20 centimetres that way. I've got a big 50-inch screen uh, that I watch. Mm. Um, and uh, I had on the, what is it called? Oh, I'm sorry, I don't know the name of it properly. The Working Group, New Zealand's best weekly political podcast and not funded by New Zealand On Air. And uh, they had on that tonight a friend of the show, uh, Simon Wilson, sitting right next to uh, David Seymour. And I'll show you a screenshot. I'll show you a screenshot. We'll talk about this tomorrow night because I haven't had time to prep it, but it'll be tomorrow night. Let me show you a, a screenshot. And this this moment, right, is Simon Wilson taking apart David Seymour? See if you can see if you, David Seymour looks a little bit uncomfortable. What, what do you think about this? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, we talked last week about him getting flustered in a situation, but uh, Simon Wilson went hard nuts. And I actually I messaged him, what did I say to him while he was doing it? And I said to Simon, um, I'm watching you bounce with anticipation, waiting to speak after David Seymour on the treaty. Good luck with that. <laughs> to which he responded, I won't share his response to me because that was the thing. Um, so there you go. So we will cover that off uh, tomorrow night. It was actually a really interesting chat and they covered a bunch of stuff. It's a good podcast, actually. People should check it out if they don't do so already. Um, yeah, so that'll be tomorrow. That might make you feel a bit better. The other thing, uh, I've had a, we, we've had a long weekend because obviously yesterday it was uh, Chuck's birthday. And so we had a long weekend. I spent the weekend watching movies. I did John Wick 3 on Friday because I had to get back into it. I did John Wick 4 on Saturday. On Sunday, I did Ant-Man Quantumania, which I hadn't watched that's yet. Good. And on that's Monday, I did Guy Ritchie's The Covenant. Oh, that's one I haven't watched yet. Mm. And I have to say, you, so you weren't that impressed with John Wick 4? What, what are your thoughts? No, I like, love John Wick 4. Ant-Man just looked like Spy Kids 3D. Uh, you know what? I, I, it's since <laughs> Avengers has finished, since that whole thing's wrapped up, I'm far less interested in the Marvel Universe. You know, I was on that journey through the Avengers and through all those, hmm. far less interested. But I eventually watched it. And um, I have to say, Paul Rudd was as good as ever. The story was, but I enjoyed yeah, see, Paul Rudd's comedy. That that's my big criticism, right? What made the Ant Man movies good is Paul Rudd. Yeah, and then they put him essentially in the background to a whole bunch of other characters we don't really care about. Um, and and they were just on a green screen the entire time. Yeah, it wasn't. It didn't feel grounded. It looked crap. I I, I did not care. But um, when Paul Rudd if, when Paul Rudd did his Paul Rudd stuff, when it was focused on him. It was as good as any other Paul Rudd movie, like Ant-Man movie. But yeah, there was so much other stuff going on. It felt like it lost a little bit to me. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I would agree with that. Um, I was talking about this with some friends of mine. How, like, we're basically a peak superhero, and it's it's, it's yeah. really hard to sort of rust, rustle up a care. I did find the fix to that. And that's the latest Spider-Verse movie. Uh, I haven't seen the first one, because this is the second Into the oh, Spider-Verse, yeah? mate. Okay, so when the first Spider-Verse movie came out, whatever year that was, that yeah. was my favorite movie of the year. Oh, wow. It's spectacular. The art style is amazing. The story is just so on point. It's so well written. You give a shit about all of the characters. Yep. It's amazing. And yeah. the second one, I was like, well, there's no way they can top the, top the first one. 
and I was just like, "Oh my god, this is this is so cool! They've done this so so well." Okay. Um, it it is like I love I love those movies, man. They're so good. Spider Man is it, it's a just pig? a good story. I I, it's just I, so I, good. I I think probably part of me being a, a grumpy old curmudgeon looked at the cartoons and went, nah. I mean, you know, maybe, maybe not. Didn't really get into it as much, didn't watch it, but I watched them both now. Speaking of that, though, I was thinking about after the end of John Wick 4. Now, no spoilers for John Wick 4, but this is going to sound really ironic because if you're a John Wick fan, the, the fighting and the shooting and the guns are all a, a huge part of it. There was too much. Like, I would like to go through it and actually time code the the dialogue and the action there versus the guns and the shooting and i have to say one thing you know how they wear these kevlar suits and in the mm. first one it was like you can do this and it can protect you a little bit it was like they were unloading uzis at them and they were doing this and this was enough to protect them and now i i kind of sat on the way through and went oh this is the john wick universe a bit like this is mm. the superhero universe so that's okay but this is what I thought when I got to the end of John Wick. If you're a fan of the John Wick series, you'll probably really like it. I still enjoyed it, right? I still did. But if you've never seen the John Wick, watch the first one. That's all you need. The first one is the best. It wraps well. It's amazing. Um, if you went straight to the fourth one, like if you hadn't seen the first three, you'd be like, what the fuck is going what on here? What a insane person yeah. would do. <laughs> do yeah. I, yeah. I, I mean, I agree with all of that, uh, all of that criticism, but I, I, I then just take that considered thoughtful reasoned position and then I put it in the bin because it was fucking cool it was fucking like, rule of cool applied um the comments that i made at a packed cinema in the without saying too much towards the end when he's trying to get up those stairs yeah 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 un unrepeat unrepeatable just yeah so good yeah yeah no like i i let me get, don't get me wrong I, it's not that i didn't enjoy it it's that i just went how would someone else address this? And there was just a lot. It was a lot going on, but it was good. And the last Ooh, one was Guy cool. Ritchie's the Guy Ritchie's the Covenant. Really, really good. Really good. I was a bit in intrigued how, how a British man would tell an American uh, pseudo story. For those who don't know, it's about how America basically shat on a whole bunch of translators in Afghanistan by promising mm. them safe it, it, passage it, it, to America. Yeah, but then left them all behind. So it's a it's a fictional story, but it's based on events that actually happened. And um, yeah, Jake Gyllenhaal, really good. Really enjoyed it. Really, really good um yeah well, well recommended so i don't know why but we just we had a weekend of movies that's just what we did I, you know i've got that big 65 inch in my house and it's like get comfy fires on and away we go nice all right now tonight we've got a really full show which is probably why we shouldn't have just talked for eight minutes about movies but you know that's what we do and if you'll have seen the uh, write-up for what's coming up tonight um you will you will know there's a lot that we've put in to talk about as always we've got kind of three main stories we've got two or three little stories along the side as well and we're trying to disperse them and if we you know stay here till 1 a.m like us we'll do our one hour show that finishes about 1 a.m we'll 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 get on to it but um we should probably kick start oh the, the the big interview tonight as well and if you're a patron uh you've already uh seen it and speaking of patrons i should probably do this shouldn't i uh because we have a small announcement and a thanks to someone oh the other thing is uh the t-shirts we've been talking about for a while i'm in communication with the person at the moment and hopefully we'll have something sorted out by the end of this week so stick with us about that a big kia ora and g'day to Kimberly down here in the patron level. Uh, she was in the fuel level, uh, but she decided to up it by one, and so Kimberly has jumped across to the patron level uh, by going from $8 a month to $15 a month. If you want to be a part of what we do, if you want to support what we do, if you enjoy what we do, then just head to patreon.com forward slash big hearing news. But as we always say, not as a way to kind of get you out of being a patron, but just because we know it's different strokes for different folks. If you... Um, if you don't want to do that or you can't do that, you don't have the capacity to do that, other ways you can support us is to tell tell people about us. Let them know what we're doing, share our stuff. Um, what I did over the weekend for everybody was to put a whole bunch of stuff out on Twitter and, and, and YouTube so that you had con you had content coming of the days that we weren't here. So we put out about 10, 10 clips if you split them up between YouTube and, and Twitter over the weekend. And, you know, another way you can help us and support us is to tell people about us and hashtag share our shit. Hey, Chewy. Um, I can't hear you at all. Have you turned your mic off or something happened? Or have I lost you? Oh, I've lost you all together. No one can hear you, Chewy. Well, I can't hear you. People in the in the uh, chat, can you hear uh, Chewy? Because I can't hear Chewy in the slightest. Sing me, a, sing me a lullaby, Chewy, and people in the chat can tell me if they can see you or not, or hear you, I should say, because I can't. So one of us is down. It's either me talking to myself now, 
or it's uh, you and I haven't touched anything on this end. Tell us something, Chewy. Sing to me. Tell us a... No, he's saying to him. All right. So, uh, yeah, no, Chewy. There you go. No, nah, people can't hear you, Chewy. Log off, log on. And whilst you're doing that, I'll go play a bit of video. You try and figure your, figure your shit out, Chewy. And um, we will have a look at probably the biggest news story of today. But there are other news stories going on. And that is the issue with uh, Minister Wood and his airport shares. So let's have a look as to what happened with Minister Wood and uh, TVNZ's Silver Fox. There's a Silver Fox on both channels, but TVNZ's Silver Fox wanted to tell us about it. And this is uh, Michael Wood and what's been going on there. Michael Wood was advised by officials half a dozen times to sell his shares in Auckland Airport. His failure to comply now costing him his job as Transport Minister, at least for the moment. Yeah, it's another ministerial moment. drama for, for Labour, moment. with the opposition leader pointing out the clear conflict of interest. Here's political editor Jessica Much Mackay. Michael Wood is known as a cautious minister, mm. shown here wheeling his bike he knows riding in front of cameras often doesn't end well. But today a fall from grace has seen him temporarily stripped of his transport portfolio. So I have to take my medicine around this and I have to put these two things right. I think it is an unacceptable situation for him to find himself in uh, and therefore I think the best thing to do is stand him down while he does resolve those matters. It's about $13,000 in Auckland airport shares he bought as a teenager and yep. thought were in a trust. When he discovered they weren't, he didn't declare them properly and forgot to get around to selling them, even though he said he would multiple times, all while being Transport Minister. If I think because they had an old email address, and in the reality of the fairly busy life that I have, I didn't get yeah, this to is, well, it's this, pretty... this is a pretty bad look. I mean, he's blaming an old email address, yada, yada, yada. Are you with us, Joey? You want to say hello to the, to the phone? Uh, hopefully you can hear me. Hey. Hey. Um, because, as you will hear... He was warned about it several times. So you can't really use an old email address as an excuse because it seems that there was communication with him personally about this, I think. Well, it's pretty easy to sell shares. Uh, $13,000 of shares, you just sell on shares, as I would have thought. You know, so it's not rocket science to be able to sell shares. I'm not sure that there really is a, an adequate explanation for something like this. It's clearly been on his to-do list and he hasn't done it. Um, and that's not OK. He should have done it. He'll stay on as the Minister for Auckland yep. and Immigration, and once it's sorted, he'll be back in the job. Um, I don't think the transgression is one that is so significant that he should lose his job altogether. Um, it's actually, there's actually a surprising amount of balance here by, uh, by um, Mr Seymour. Um, doesn't go out after blood, basically says he's balls up. It's not, not, he doesn't say it's not a big deal, but, you know, it's, you, David Seymour, to his credit, has 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 been slightly gracious. I don't know if I've ever said that sentence what? before in my life, but yeah, I know. You listen. Together. Look, I think this is more sloppiness than evil or dishonesty, but people do have a right to know. He should have filled his forms throughout, right? The Prime Minister's staff found out on <sighs> Friday, but Chris Hipkins was only told last night. Uh, I would have stood him down last Friday when I first found out about So this is, this is Luxon not telling the truth. You just heard the report. The office found out last week, and uh, Chris Hipkins found out last night. The response from uh, Christopher Luxon is, I would have sat him down last week. Well, he only found out about it last night. Now, you can say that's a failure of his office. Fine. But straight away, Luxon's blaming Hipkins for not talking to Wood about it last week when he only found out about it last night. Now, if Luxon had said his office needs reprimanding, fair. But that's not what he said. Listen carefully. Minister's staff found out on Friday, but Chris Hipkins was only told last night. Uh, I would have stood him down last Friday when I first found out about the issue. I, I believe in natural justice. John Key was caught out not declaring shares in Transrail. The public of New Zealand have a right to know if ministers have interests in the business entities that they are dealing with. It's been a rough ride recently. Indeed. Stuart Nash, Mika Faitari, Kitty Allen, Jan Tanetti, and now Michael Wood. Minister, you are a bit of a Mr Fix-It for Labour. You're the person they bring in when people are in trouble. Do you feel this more keenly because of that? Um, I feel it keenly because um, I made some mistakes here. I got something wrong. Um, that has created a distraction. A distraction Labour could do without, and he knows it. And Jess is with us now live. Kia ora, Jess, take this forward. What Kia happens ora, now? Jess. Well, once he's actually sold the shares, which you can imagine after today will be a top priority for the minister, and once he corrects the record, which is the list of financial... And Just quietly. What about this guy? Yeah. Just, just down it, mate. 
Just, just down, down at one. Skull, 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 skull. Once he corrects the record, which is the list of financial interests for MPs, he can come back as the transport minister, and that could be just a number of days. Of course one of the will. reasons this is so frustrating for the Prime Minister is that Michael Wood have, has a reputation for being diligent, for being meticulous. He's been in this place for a long time, and he has big portfolios. So this really was a big one for him to get wrong. No doubt the Prime Minister is also uh, worried by another minister in trouble. It's not a good look, is it? One of the key things in all of this is that Michael Wood was told at least five times over three years to sell the shares, and it just doesn't make sense why he didn't get around to it. Now, this is, this is it's not quite clear. Being told five times, I'm not defending him because Wood said they had the wrong email address. Does that mean he had five emails sent to the wrong email address? The way it's being said is he was told. When I say I told that person, it's more norm, normally more a, I, I spoke to them. And if he spoke to them, 100% correct. If it has been sent to a wrong email, it's 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 le it's less, it's not nefarious, anymore, but it's less of an issue, but it's still a balls up no matter how you look at it. I mean, how would you, when, if he were, if they said he was told five times, Shui, would you interpret that as he was at least spoken to on some of those times? Yeah, I would, I would take yeah. that as successful communication not attempts at yeah no I'm, I'm i'm with you i do agree and i'm just trying to be fair here i guess for mm. so long one of the reasons this is so damaging because it comes down to the fundamentals of this place if you have financial interest in something you can't be making decisions around it and if you do it needs to be declared it needs to be transparent you need to manage that this yet again is another labor minister having an own goal we've seen that a few times this year and no one in this place needs to be told that it's only four months until new zealanders get to decide who gets to stay and who goes so there you go there's the overall story uh the spoke uh, nationals acting auckland spokesperson paul goldsmith earlier said he believes woods failure to immediately declare the shares was a conflict of interest and a breach of his obligations as minister under the cabinet manual it presents a clear conflict of interest for a minister of transport responsible for auckland's transport network as the minister and as the minister for auckland as transport minister mr wood continues to be responsible for the auckland light rail project which is intended to link central auckland to the airport as minister for auckland he frequently sits down to discuss Auckland transport issues with the Mayor Wayne Brown and possibly uh, its own investment in the airport. All of it fair, completely yep. appropriate. The one thing I will say, and, and we said this last week, yeah, the with the national attack ads on, uh, I'm sorry, the Labour attack ads on national around the, you know, women's health and all completely fair, completely fair fodder. This is completely fair fodder for national to attack Labour on, attack ads. However, I'm not saying they're not appropriate attacks i just noticed today in one of their attempts so this is a, a national uh, tweet today the, the the counteract for all these ministers who are who are part of the coalition of chaos is announcements announces mm. announces 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 and getting back to farming policy so that's an announcement so they're criticizing Labour correctly so for what they're calling a, a, a coalition of chaos. Yet their response is, "You should vote for us because we've talked about a bunch of stuff." Just pointing that out that it's not even though they've got the it's, it's a it's a fair attack and it's a good attack by National on on Labour, they don't seem to have very much to back it up with actually with what the attack is, Chile. Yeah, when the, this story broke this morning, I was like, "Oh my god!" My first reaction is, "Are, are we not at a stage where?" you can get your shit sorted knowing that this is going to blow up at some point, right? And, and is it sloppiness or is it just disregard or is it malicious? Again, those are the questions that should always be asked. It's, it's not great that it's labor. It's, I, I wish it wasn't. But I can solve this right now. Well, the, the other thing I'd say <laughs> before I go ahead and solve it. I saw your tweet today. Is, I know what you're solving. Is, is. You do. You, you've seen behind the curtain. Is this... <laughs> keeps happening to ministers doesn't matter what party they're in and i don't like saying i agree with david seymour so we can't have that again <laughs> um, i i'm an uncharitable man when it comes to david seymour i'd say he's saying that because he's probably got some conflicts of interest in his cupboard as well but yeah, here, well, that, here that, I'll solve that could it. be the case yeah that could be the case here i'll solve it go for it if you are an mp if you are in government or trying to be in government, 
you should not have investments. You should not have a portfolio of houses. Mm. You just sell everything. You decide what you're going to do because everything that you do in government, every decision that you make will affect that. You are not transparent. You have literally invested interest in what's going on. How can we trust ministers who pretty much all have investment portfolios and family trusts and that sort of thing to make the right decision if it's going to negatively affect their investments? And, and this it. is and this is not the first time we've had this this kind of conversation. Everyone will know who watches us regularly. In the past, we've talked about, you know, and it was about uh, um, Minister Mahuta and her husband having completely above board and, and legitimate contracts with government agencies. However, the appearance of a conflict of interest is not is, is almost as bad as a conflict of interest. It's not, but the appearance yep. of. And so I've been saying all this year, not to be too graphic, but if you share a bed with someone or if you share a bank account with someone and you're a minister, the person who you are partnered with just can't get government contracts. Even legit above board, you just can't. You've got to make that choice to even stamp out the appearance of the conflict of interest. A bunch of people in the chat sort of uh, echoing the things around um, David Seymour. That's surprising. Of, yeah, it uh, feels Seymour. yucky. I don't like it. Don't Seymour surprised me. Me too. Uh, John also says something interesting. Not exactly Labour working class look, is it? Uh, between this and vape policy clearly protecting corporate interests, good to see Greens doing something left sounding with mm. renter solidarity thing. Um, and then there's a bunch of you guys who are talking about Uffendale. Luxon, of course, stood Uffendale down the moment he knew, oh, that, oh, never mind. Um, and also Guru says, uh, hilarious to hear Uffendale's sponsor daring to call the PM yeah. week. Continuing on about uh, Wood, though, uh, what a disappointment, Dick. <laughs> I think that's pretty things. Um, and as others are saying, yes, well, Peter, again, sorry, fodder for Luxon's coalition of chaos. Like we've said, part of your job as a politician is not to give the other side fodder. This is completely mm. fodder. Um, now, it also makes me think about me. I'm terrible at getting jobs done. Like, I've got a list, and the list keeps getting longer and longer and longer. That's why I could never be an MP, because this is exactly the kind of thing I would do. Yeah, I'll get around to it. 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 Oh, shit. I've just lost my portfolio. Um, so, yeah. It's 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 not a good look. As 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 David Seymour said himself, it's not evil or necessarily nefarious, my word, not his. Um, but it's sloppiness completely. It's but fucking dumb. Do you want it's, to put it? It's a, super dumb. Do you want to put in a government that is can legitimately be claimed as being sloppy mm. that's the problem yeah i mean I, I i see people point out as well you know john key got caught on this yep he 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 oh i forgot about these thirty thousand shares and and um i think it was kiwi rail at the time uh, I don't worry, I got a bit, got got rid of those, and then it turned out he actually had another hundred thousand shares right. that he also didn't declare. So I mean, people keep on falling into this trap, and no one seems to be paying attention to it and making sure shit. I better not do what that guy did because because that looks awkward and embarrassing for everyone. They keep it, doing it, so in a, get in rid America, of your investments. Well, in America, they make them have a blind trust. Um, so yep. they sell their shares, but they can keep they can keep money in the share market. But it's in bought they blindly whoever you know looks after that their blind trust. They don't know what their shares are and what they're in. That could be a solution. But I hear what you're saying, Chewy, but that's never going to happen. So I guess no, I not. mean like no one's ever going to force MPs. If you want to be an MP, you're not allowed to own any properties. That's never going to happen. So therefore, what's the what's the legitimate way of doing this and maybe a blind trust would be it however even with that if you own seven properties i doubt they're going to force you to sell seven properties and buy seven properties so you are still going to know what's going on but for shares i think the big thing in america is with shares they they do sell your shares but then they rebuy other shares like someone looks after the blind trust to get you the similar value but you don't know what your shares are in of course unless you're donald trump and it's your sons who are operating the blind trust which i believe is what they did yeah, just just ridiculous. And and look, I I honestly don't think anything to that level of just out and out grift is happening in the New Zealand system. 
but yeah. anything we can do to tighten it up and make it more transparent and know that our elected officials aren't just feathering their own nests like robber kings would be great yeah i mean these guys get pretty good remuneration and excellent perks so you know do you really need a, a shitload of shares seven houses mr luxon and you're saying that landlords should get a tax cut come on come right. on we're going to keep trucking because we've got a lot to get to here's a little shorty for you um how about this one uh jordan b peterson i almost can't say this was a straight face face uh he put out a tweet today calling reuters leftist shills because they did a news report on jacinda ardern getting her uh night's honor her king's weekend honor the way he wrote it was leftist shills reuters celebrate catastrophic failure jacinda ardern so here's the story that he's linked to and literally i mean when he when he, when he when i read the tweet i thought ah oh, you know they've gone in with a glowing report of jacinda and they think that she's the best thing since sliced bread and all this it actually is just quite a facts only report it talks about what she was named talked about the king charles's birthday made the onions list it was the awardee is chosen by the prime minister uh talks about um recognized for his services during some of new zealand's greatest challenges including i think it, it lists the terror attacks covid 19 and uh Fikari, white island it's there's really not really any opinion in here so it was a particularly strange and interesting tweet and i noticed through some of the tweets obvious to some of the responses obviously there's a lot of haters in there but one of the first ones i live in new zealand and disagree with much of what labor government did and or didn't do under Jacinda idea and yet in my view she certainly deserved this award it seems to me that they did the very best with the mess of information available at the time um and that's there's a there's like a there's a lot of people obviously who are saying what a, they don't like her at all then there's other ones you know from your soapbox podium maybe so but for others she fought the dragons you know so there's a bit of pushback going on in there as well um, as a New Zealander, pretty much every Prime Minister gets the honorary title and it doesn't mean much, but Reuters is playing it up a bit for sure, so I don't blame you for thinking it's a big deal. So basically saying it's not a big deal, even if you think it is. Now, um, I want to show one more thing about this, about the catastrophic failure, but first of all, any any thoughts around the, I guess, the award, Chewy? Any thoughts around, uh, you know, Peterson chiming in? Oh, look, I, I, I would have wished that that was sort of not so much a tweet but in his voice because i miss his kermit the frog sort hey, of tone kermit his the little waistcoat frog, you? um i personally i think if jordan peterson doesn't like you you're doing pretty good that's probably worth more <laughs> than the award to be honest i'd be stoked mm. yeah uh, i i mean is anybody surprised that jacinda was in the honors list of course not like objectively if Bill you're English, not john key completely infested with brain worms yeah um can, can you imagine like who not deserving it yeah like i and, and i think that that commenter going yeah you don't have to agree with labor you don't have to be a labor supporter she was a leader of new zealand in an incredibly chaotic time and dealt yeah. with some some really big moments that i think incredibly well for the most part I think that's worthy of 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 a nod, and everybody else that that is just like oh, I don't know, I hate her. She's a demon. She's worse than Goebbels. Um, you know, give them the attention that well, they deserve. Nothing. Let, let's just have a look at this. I want to look at one more part of this because Peterson refers to her as a catastrophic failure, right? <laughs> and um, I want I, I I look. I I don't think we need to do this necessarily, but I want to do this. I think what he's referencing, obviously, is things around COVID. Because there's not very much that anyone can reference to do with that. Now, I think the number one job of a government is to probably keep its citizens safe. Probably. I mean, there's probably several big mm -hmm. jobs. That's one of the biggest jobs, to keep its citizens safe. Now, the ultimate form of being safe is being alive, right? And not dying. So I think if we have a quick look, just because we haven't done this for a very long time, at New Zealand's death rate around COVID uh, via the population, what you'll see, and I've highlighted us here, for those of you who are watching, 898 people died per million, right? Total of 4,500 people. Other than Australia, who ironically pretty much had about the same kind of shutdowns and lockdowns and, you know, rules around yep. uh, rules around isolation as we did. Other than Australia, there's pretty much no one else above us from a Western country. 
You know, I, I haven't looked in great detail, but you can see the names going past Egypt, Qatar, you know, Kiribati, or Kiribati, Kiribati uh, Afghanistan. You know, there's pretty much no other Western country other than Australia who's basically the same as us, above us. Flipping that around, if you look at who's below us, right, all the people who say that we should have done it like other places, that's a cool thing for you to say. But if mm. we had have done it like, uh, I don't know, let's say uh, France and Spain had done it, who are down here somewhere, probably squeeze past them. Uh, and if you looked at their death rate per population, that'd be 13,000 dead New Zealanders versus four and a half thousand. If you look at it versus there's Spain there, there's France there. If you look at it, what the UK, how the UK did it, and I'm only using these countries because they're similar to us, a bit more Western, and the death rate at 3,300 3, per million, you'd be looking at about 15 and a half thousand dead New Zealanders. And USA down here, at three and a half thousand, uh, you'd be looking at about 17,000 dead New, Ze New Zealanders. So when Jordan Peterson says catastrophic failure, if what he's referencing is how COVID was handled and restrictions, and we can debate lockdowns and, and mandates, we can debate that. But the hard, cold fact of it is how we did it, whether you think it was right or wrong, saved thousands of New Zealand lives thousands and thousands and thousands of New Zealanders are alive today that would not have been alive if we had followed a model like the UK or the US or basically any other Western country bar us in Australia who did a pretty similar thing. So mm. I'm sorry, Jordan B. Peterson, hey ho, um, but your catastrophic failure is thousands and thousands of more New Zealanders still alive today. So I don't know the technical academic term for it, but I think it's something like you can go fuck yourself. Yeah, no, that is. Oh, that is. Okay, good. That, Just check that, that is the term. Yeah. No, good, good. <laughs> I think that one's wrapped up, don't you think? I don't think we need anything else for that. <laughs> no, moving on. Suck it, okay. Peterson. Suck it, Peterson. Um, okay, let's have a look at our uh, feature interview for tonight. As a pre-record, I spoke with Shane Curry this afternoon. Now, last week we talked about the noise that the Free Speech Union was making over this. I should probably check this. Just check that you can hear the noise for this, Chewy. That is dominated by members of... Yep. You hear that? Okay, good. Because we hadn't actually yep. tested that. And I was just saying, this is the one time it's not going to work. Anyway, so I'll start this again. So we're really slick here, and I'll cut all of this out when we do the clip, and no one will know that's happened. <clears throat> so our feature interview tonight is... <laughs> um, uh, he used to be the editor of The Herald. So he's someone who's intrinsically intertwined with content and content going online. And we talked last week about the Free Speech Union in an interview that we played with them that they did on um, the platform. And they seem to be saying that this discussion document around um, regulations that will sit above uh, social media and sit above this kind of thing, things like internet broadcasts, which currently there is no regulation for them and it needs to be brought in. This is what the discussion document is talking about. Now, I've read the discussion document and surprise, 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 it is nothing as is reported by the Free Speech Union. They're absolutes. Yeah, I know. Shock horror. Um, so what I thought I'd do is actually get on a reputable source. He is still working at NZME. He is the editor at large. He's no longer the editor of the Herald, but he's just come out of that position to talk about what the document was about, what it said, what it didn't say, their concerns, their not concerns. Um, and I think it's, he, there's a lot of really good information in there uh, for those of us who want to actually be accurate, which may not be the Free Speech Union, have to say about it. So we'll play this for you now. We'll be back in about 15 or 20 minutes, and then we'll go on with a couple of other stories for today. So this is Shane Curry uh, from NZME. Uh, editor at large talking with me this afternoon about um, this discussion document around regulations, uh, an ombudsman, if you would, for social media, internet broadcasts, and then to come under it the traditional media as well. Back soon. I want to welcome to the show Shane Curry, News, NZME's editor at large. I nearly said New Zealand me there, Shane. NZME's editor at large, former editor of the Herald. That's correct, isn't it? The New Zealand Herald? That's right, Pat. Yes. Yeah. I was editor, you know, great five years of my career as editor. I was going to ask uh, you as well about what that title means. Editor at large sounds like someone who spends a lot of time speaking to people in a cafe, kind of off doing <laughs> things in different parts of the country. You're at large, you know? Yeah, yeah. It's a little, a little bit of that. I'm certainly uh, trying to build up my contact base again. But uh, so I'm, I'm only three months into the role, so uh, I've got the training wheels on. 
Yeah, no, I've actually got the press release right here for when you uh, when you took over in March of 2023. It says a role that will combine frontline journalism, strategic content initiatives across NZME's digital, audio and print platforms. So with this legislation, with this discussion document around legislation, you look like you have a finger in kind of every pie to have a talk to about uh, what's going on. So thanks for giving us some time today. No, no, no problem at all. It's great to be here. The document in and of itself is called Safer Online Services and Media Platforms Dash discussion document so it's a discussion document a white paper or something like that a, a a starting point to start this chat and i guess we i want to start um you because terrestrial traditional media has is heavily regulated although I, my experience is in radio so i'm i'm across the bsa it's a pretty toothless dog it is a it is a, a group that can go oh you've been naughty such and such on the radio now apologize but it doesn't seem to be able to impose fines or have any kind of sort of uh, quote unquote punishments for it with this new regulation seems to be more a little bit more heavy handed in that it has it, it's proposed to have authority to do that kind of stuff but we're looking at social media and I guess we're looking not that many people have talked about this but where we're sitting right now is like internet media as well so what mm -hmm. we do right now we don't have any regulations over us uh, many of these new internet platforms don't have any regulations over them so the way I think about this is social media and internet type broadcast media companies as well Be before we look in actually what it says do you think social media and groups like us and i guess like the platform and that kind of thing need to have some kind of regulatory body above them should they cross a line i think just to rewind a couple of your points there firstly pat just on the bsa for starters um yep no, the BSA definitely has the power to impose heavy fines. Um, okay. And so, and that has happened in, in over the course of history with various um, cases. Not often, I must I must say. Um, I think one of the reasons for this discussion document is there is a fair bit of confusion in the market and and amongst consumers about who they can complain to. If say, for instance, the Herald gets something wrong or News Talk ZB gets something wrong. Um, in the case of digital traditional media platforms such as nzherald.co or stuff, um, it's still the Media Council. And the Media Council has been around for many decades and was looking after print publications initially. Whereas, with, yes, you're right, for the broadcasters, the traditional broadcasters, terrestrial broadcasters, Television New Zealand and so forth, it's, uh, uh, it is the Broadcasting Standards Authority. And they are different bodies. And then there's an, about three or four other different bodies that for instance, the Advertising Standards Authority. But to bring back to your question around um, do, do other platforms need to be regulated, I'd say, and this is the feedback I've received and you know, informing my own kind of view and perception of it all as well, social media in particular, um, there does need to be, I think, a closer look at the regulations or lack of them that govern, govern social media. I do think that platforms such as your own, as the and I spoke to Sean Plunkett about this last week, such as the platform, there are still laws in New Zealand which govern what you can and can't say. I mean, we still have the Defamation Act. There's the yep. Harmful Digital yep. Communications Act. So there is actually legislation in place for platforms, not just for you guys and for the Herald, but, you know, for a lot of what we've seen in the last decade, I guess, the startups. But it is really where the internal affairs has directed a lot of attention in this discussion paper is around social media in particular. And this is a massive beast uh, of a uh, kind of a, a task ahead of them, I guess, to try and rein in individuals who, um, you know, it's a bit of the Wild West on some parts of social media in particular. Sometimes I think about the, those regulatory bodies, and look, to be honest, I wasn't aware that, maybe because I've never experienced the BSA ever imposing a fine, they normally say, uh, like, the, there's a process to go through, which is, let's say it was Newstalk ZB, which is where I used to work, you complain to Newstalk ZB, if the response they give you is not to your satisfaction, you then go to the BSA, and then they decide whether there's some kind of action. I've never, I've never heard of anyone getting fined, but then again, I've obviously not in that world, uh, so to speak. But it, it seems that the, uh, the, the, uh, the regulatory bodies aren't necessarily so much about the legal side of things like defamation, but they're kind of about this is how we do it. Like Sean Plunkett's a good example. He had a, a guest on a wee while ago that we featured, Suze Wilson, and he door stopped her. And we phoned her off, up off the blue, out of the blue and put her on the radio and she didn't know, well, the radio, the internet, she didn't know she was being talked to on the radio. The B, for the BSA, that would be a clear breach for a radio station, but for the internet, it's not. There's nothing illegal going on. 
but it's almost like some of these regulatory body, bodies are a bit like, hey, that's not cricket. That's not how we've agreed to do things. Is that the difference between sort of the regulation and the laws as we're looking at it? That's right. I guess there's different levels, right? So last year I, I um, spent about two or three months of 2022 in my old role as editor-in-chief here at NZME developing an entirely new editorial code of conduct with the newsroom, and that's available publicly on our website. But previously, we I think we had two pages of kind of um, protocols. That now extends to, I think, around a dozen pages. It is very extensive and recognises the modern world we live in. We hadn't updated our own code probably for about a decade. And so yeah. that was long yeah. overdue. So you have that level within each newsroom in New Zealand, I guess, of traditional media. And then there, the regulatory bodies, whether that's uh, self-regulators, regulators, such as the Media Council or... Um, uh, you know, the Broadcasting Standards Authority, they have another set of code and principles very similar to the ones that the newsrooms operate under anyway. But the industries have all agreed to those codes. And so that does give any complainants, you know, documents upon which to base their complaints or concerns. The example you just used is a classic example. We, yeah. we have to be really clear, unless there are exceptional circumstances, that you identify yourself as either a reporter or a broadcaster for your given organisation. There might be occasions, and this is when you're dealing with, um, uh, for instance, fraudsters or people who have um, been accused of ripping people off, where you are doorstopping people and trying to get comment really, really quickly, but 99.9% um, .9 of cases you're identifying yourself up front. So, yeah. So, uh, you know, it's really important that uh, obviously our newsrooms abide by those codes and, our, yep. and yep. our reporters are aware of them, but also for the public to know that there is a backstop, to know that actually I'm not satisfied with the way they've handled this complaint. I can go to the Media Council. In the Media Council's case, that is dominated by members of the public. So there are industry representatives on it, but for every complaint they hear, there is a majority uh, independent members of the public who consider it. Sounds like it should be a, um, a, like a reality TV show. The Media Council, dun, dun, dun. You could be looking at all the cases. You could be broadcasting it. Um, now, you, you kind of referenced there sort of self-regulation. I want to go straight to the proposed document, the discussion document, because um, I've been listening to the Free Speech Union over the last week or so, and the Free Speech Union seem to think the sky is falling. In my personal perspective, they seem to be thinking that this is the, the worst thing to happen to free speech since the history of the world, and uh, I believe have, have kind of inaccurately labelled this document as, oh, you know, so what they're saying is if you see something nasty on the internet, we can try and help you get it taken down, which is completely not what the document said. That In fact, that's almost a quote from one of the interviews I heard talking about nasty things on the internet. One of the things I don't think has been talked about very much is as I read this document, this, the, the discussion document, step one to a process, thinking that in Australia this process has still been going on for two years, so it's not going to be a fast process, is that the document is saying industry X, whichever one it is, you guys come up with the proposal, you guys come up with the code of conduct, and then when you don't, or when someone or you don't adhere to it, or someone wants to complain that you've breached it, that then comes to us. I'll just read out this one paragraph. Platforms will need to have operating policies in place to meet these requirements, the requirements that they've talked about previously, but will have the flexibility to decide how to achieve them. Industry groups will develop the codes and with input from the by sorry with input from and approved by the regulator. This approach leaves editorial decision making in the hands of the platforms, while ensuring users have a greater transparency and protection. As you read the document, is that how you see it? Stage one, step one, they're saying you guys come up with a code of practice, code of conduct, when there's a breach, in theory, if this was to go through, they then would complain to us. Yeah, so uh, the document's a little, I mean, that was a snapshot, as it was titled, um, of the document. Um, the document's, uh, I think, around 100-odd uh, pages long, and I went through it um, uh, just before it was released under embargo. And there are other points in there which says the regulator will, uh, if it's not happy with the code of um, conduct that's said industry has come up with yep. they will step yep. in um, necessarily now well, I, I, I guess it does say that i guess it does say that in this because it says uh, with uh, input and approval from the regulator so so it's basically the the industry comes up with the code if the yep. regulator is not happy they can change or input it but it seems to be a collaborative effort started by the industry that's right and then um and they would still leave the handling of the initial complaint with say the media council right uh, this is what the indication i'm getting and then if things, um, and then there's a right of appeal 
to the regulator on this. I guess it becomes a three-step process. You complain initially to the media organisation. Yep. Um, yep. We're talking, and then to the media council. And if you're still not happy, you can go to this. What I what I initially termed as the superpower. Um, yeah. In terms of the arguments around the free speech union and what they're saying, where they've come at it from is around they have claimed and asserted that this isn't this does uh, impact on freedom of expression, that there's already laws in place to govern that. I guess what it will come down to in that respect of uh, any new legislation is what, how do you define harm? And this is really, I mean, at the heart of it all, this is a good, you know, the proposal, um, everyone's got the best interests at heart of kids, of people who use the internet, making sure we're safe, right? Yeah. But where the free speech union, one of their points was that how do you define harm? There has to be, and some of the mainstream media organisations pick up on this as well, that there has to be an objective classification of harm. If it's subjective, we fall into all sorts of difficulties because then it really does come down to you have a regulator who's opining on cases where natural biases might be coming into decision making. So, uh, and I guess that's where the um, you know the hate speech laws came unstuck um, most recently. It's just so hard to define you know what one person's harm is compared to another. Yeah, and- very big gray well, area and, and we would we would agree with that completely 100 percent of this it just feels like not not that this interview is about the free speech union but the free speech union literally came out saying you know when sean plunkett said to them the other day you know oh, is there imprisonment involved and they literally said well you know they're too smart to put that into the document i have no problems debating what should and shouldn't go in what i have a problem with the free speech union is not that i want to talk about them is that i believe they're beating up and scaremongering saying we know what they're really trying to do people we know what they're really trying to do whereas yourself and anna Rafiti uh, Connell on News Hub uh, called this document a great start. Yeah, I, I think it's a it's a long overdue discussion, particularly as I say around social media. Uh, I do believe that you know for so long, and I think I said this on uh, the Nation uh, the other morning, uh, is that for so long the, the big social media giants haven't come to the table. Yeah, you know, I yeah. think um, I, I do think that. You know, with um, producing content or distributing content comes a great deal of uh, obligation on you to for responsibilities. Now, look, um, the social media giants themselves, I spoke to Meta briefly last week. They've got their own independent code, which has been drawn up in the last 12 months or so. Um, but we, you would think that, uh, you know, we're almost two decades in now, aren't we, to, to the likes of um, Facebook and so forth, that yeah. something might, a bit more concrete might have been in place before now. And that's the other point is around this whole discussion document. It is a great start because our current laws, the Broadcasting Act and so forth, these were um, drafted well before any advent of um, social media <laughs> yeah. in particular. And so it is, it, it is long overdue in that respect. I guess the concern, the, the, free, the free speech union were out in one sort of um, atmosphere, hemisphere with their concerns. I think the mainstream media's kind of focus was a little more kind of there was concern and there was caution, but that was more around the, just making sure the principles of um, free press weren't. Um, well, yeah, could you could you nutshell that for me? And I know this is a discussion document, so I'm not going to ask you to do what I feel like the Free Speech Union is doing, which are they saying this is what it really means? We're not going to do that. But following this discussion through to its nth degree, like theoretically, um, how could the proposal, if made law, affect freedom of the press? Like, what's the worst case scenario that this kind of thing could do to impact groups like yourself? Yeah, they say, um, you know, they were really clear that they themselves know that they're in territory here where they have to have a really careful balance. I think um, Suzanne Doig um, made that point in her press release, you know, that the last thing they want to do is impact on uh, a negative impact on free speech and free and freedom of the press. And that they're really important principles of democracy, as we know. I guess we are the, some of the media businesses came from um, the likes of Stuff and TVNZ, RNZ. Um, they all said that that's fine. We're already heavily regulated. The last thing we need is more cost put upon us, uh, which impacts on, now this is literal cost, um, yeah. uh, because that impacts on content gathering, news gathering, and that, that plays out in terms of resourcing and newsrooms. So, you know, they were quite specific around some of these areas uh, and made good points in those areas that the system right now for them uh, and as far as they're concerned, now obviously the public will be the judge of this, but you know that there are already safeguards in place for the public to 
raise concerns and have their concerns um, considered both under the law and through the various industry bodies that look after it. I must say, um, a couple of them admitted, it is messy. You have a BSA, you have a media council, you have an advertising standards authority. I think there could be a tidy up in right. that area as part of this. So just to make it super clear to um, consumers where they head to if they have concerns. It sounds like uh, you need a bit of a gold card. When Winston Peters brought the gold card out, he, basically all he did was bring all the other like bonus cards for retirees under one under one title. Um, he, here's, the, here's the obvious question, I think, to ask on the flip side of this. What if we do nothing? Like what if, and, I, and I'm not saying this is the, what the free speech union would want, but what if it's a, a group that goes, everything's fine right now, we should do nothing, freedom of speech, yada, 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 yada. What if we do nothing? Are there downsides? What are the downsides of that? Yeah, so if you, um, the example that uh, was raised in the document, and a really important example, was that recently TikTok, for instance, there was a suicide video um, being screened on TikTok. Um, we know what happened uh, during the mosque attacks in Christchurch, uh, you know, whether the, the video was screened, live streamed live um, to the public. That's the kind of harmful, um, damaging, horrific content that needs to but be this, But out. this wouldn't stop that. And this is not going to stop someone getting on a live stream with a gun. It might stop some of what happens after it, but it wouldn't stop the event from happening, would it? Uh, well, it would, uh, at the very least, with Facebook, who, you yep. know, very clearly in the years after Christchurch have put in more safeguards as a result. But it would actually be, I guess, um, rather than, to hate, hate using a cliche, an ambulance at the foot of the cliff, but actually right. you know, having the barrier at the top so that Facebook's actually on guard all the time to ensure that their technology doesn't allow that kind of material to be um, screened live. So because of the regulations, all the new laws, whatever they're going to be, legislations, um, face, uh, face guard, Facebook, Facebook now has basically a duty of care to attempt as much as it can to keep that off rather than reacting to it when it comes on. Correct. And, uh, and very similar to the, uh, I guess, the regulation that's already imposed or um, that the mainstream media companies already comply to. It's really, um, as I say, bringing the Facebooks, Meta, um, Twitter and TikTok to the table and goodness knows who, are, who is coming in the future. And, and interestingly, you know, even this document you could argue is a little bit, you know, it's just being produced, right? After yeah. two or three yeah. years of consultation uh, with, the, with the industry and with the public. But when we started a consultation on it a couple of years ago, AI wasn't even really considered. Yeah, true. I, I almost feel, you know, I searched the term artificial intelligence and AI on the document. I think there's about four references to it in this hundred page kind of document. There's going to be need to be some serious thinking about just where AI um, takes us in terms of regulation and, and content. As well. And look, I think, I think, I mean, I'm sure you've seen it. Donald Trump put out that advert. It's, it's very funny. But the day after um, DeSantis made his ridiculous Twitter announcement with all the fake voices on the Twitter feed, and they're all AI voices, and most of them, if you weren't paying real attention to, you'd go, that sounds like Elon Musk. Yeah, so you could, so it's almost like it's out of date before, because it, this will take a couple of years to sort out. So they need to start adding the AI stuff in now to then be fit to purpose in two years from now. That's right, or at least having legislation, I guess, that captures future platforms and future technology um, that, so, that will be, that we don't even know has been invented yet. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Oh my God. Hey, look, uh, thank you for the chat. I, I, I want to ask you one more question. It's actually kind of like a side note. It's just something I'm interested in because there's been regulations on um, and laws made around social media in Australia to do with the amount of content, money they make off content that's locally produced. Um, mm. and, and you've talked a little bit about this, but because I'm a moron, right? I don't really understand that, Shane. I kind of want to understand if I, as a person, shares a very well written Simon Wilson document, it won't be that because it's behind the paywall. Let's say another a document from the New Zealand Herald on my Facebook page. How is Facebook responsible for making money off that of something I've done as a customer to share a bit of content I want to share? Do you know what I mean? I'm like trying to figure that out. Mm. How? But this is my little thing because I thought if I <laughs> this is a very strange thing for me to say, but if I buy a pair of Nikes, and then I run in a race where I win a million bucks. Nike doesn't see anything for that, even though I've purchased their product. I was wondering where the connection between Meta making money off Herald or ZB content versus me as a person upload choosing to upload that. I, I'm looking for some kind of connection there to understand it myself. What's the how, how do you yeah. answer that? 
Yeah, I guess, um, you know, the likes of Facebook um, in particular, um, but also Google News, um, they've created products uh, like Google News and like the Facebook News Feed um, that are solely drawing uh, content from mainstream publishers who spend a hell of a lot of money. So they're scraping. Cheap, right? Are they scraping? Are they they're scraping uh, and uploading? In some cases they are. Oh, and, and okay. Look, in some cases they are, in terms of Google, of course. But um, but in terms of, yes, I acknowledge that we're also responsible for putting our content out on these places. We need to be where our, where audiences are uh, in order for our business model to survive. But what we were simply asking and still asking in, in respect of this, and they have come to the table with... Um, obviously announced publicly that we've done deals already with um, Meta and with Google, where they've recognized that there is value to the material and content journalism that we produce. Um, you know, and this is probably a very, very tiny percentage of the overall revenue they make, uh, both in New Zealand and across the world, that actually, you know, their business, part of their business model survives on the fact that they're drawing upon journalism that we produce. Got it. Makes it. It also makes more sense with the scraping because that's actually not an individual saying, I like this article from Stuff or Herald or listen to this thing from uh, Mike Hosking. You know, it's it's actually if they're basically grabbing the information, putting it into their news feeds, especially Google, that, that I get it that, is that's good, yeah. a lot clearer. Yeah. That's right. And I think, and that's another challenge coming up with AI as well. We know that AI is scraping news websites across the world, including ours and including others in New Zealand, um, in order to build up that language, that natural language um, processing ability. Yeah, right. Fascinating. Hey, uh, Shane Curry, who is uh, NZME's editor at large, thanks so much for joining us today. Really appreciate you giving us some time. Thanks, Pat. All righty, Mighty, Chewy, that's the first time you've seen that. You want to have a, have a crack at anything that was said? Oh, God, it was uh, interesting. I haven't really f f sort of firmed up my thoughts on the whole thing, to be honest. Uh, I, I mean, it's, it's, it's fascinating to consider how these sort of things things are generated and what they've got to keep in mind the the whole mention of ai is, yeah. is like right on the money of like you have to write legislation that is flexible enough to deal with something that just pops out of nowhere and it's like oh now we've got robots that can make up lies and articles and who's responsible for that um yeah yeah no real interesting but yeah it, it, as i've said before it's it's very clear that this sort of space this podcast space you know if someone can spin up a, a a channel a brand to say anything they want you know it's got to be looked at right i think the biggest thing that i took away from it and the reason i wanted to talk to shane about it or any, any you know someone in the industry was to kind of get clarification because because i'm a moron right and i think oh does it say this and just checking with him was the the organizational group themselves the youtube the facebook the whatever is the because it could be individual um, media companies that have more than 100,000 views or 25,000 members make the code themselves. This, mm. this, this alleged regulatory body then says, yep, yep, okay, we're in agreement, that code's fine. Then there's a process at the moment, as I said in that, that you complain to the um, media company first, they have a chance to respond, you're not happy with that response, you go to the bigger company. It seems in this, what's happening now is, let, let's say the media company under this new group is, I don't know, Radio X. You complain to Radio X, Radio X responds to you with a middle finger in a professional way. You're not happy. You go to the BSA. You're not happy. You go to this bigger governing body that kind of sits over all of them. So a governing body up here and under it, there's probably still the BSA and the media council in these places. And then under that is all the media agencies. But the big thing is, and I said this really clearly asked last week, I err always on the side of more speech, but I also err on fucking accuracy. And what we were mm. getting from some groups last week was inaccurate representations of what the document said and conjecture sold as absolute truth. We know what they're trying to do was the tone of some of that stuff. Yeah, yeah now, absolutely. I, I've said this so many times on this podcast, whether they are trying to do that or not we don't know yet so you can have those concerns without scaremongering that you are 
you know, the oracle of this, you know exactly what's going to happen. Some of the conversations I had on Twitter over the weekend with some people who are supporters of the Free Speech Union, ironically trying to squash my free speech, in my opinion, ironically, um, about what I was saying, were, were, were just nonsensical because they were telling me that I, I was missing the boat and I was wrong. And I was like, okay, let's just be clear. The only thing we have said is that this group is misrepresenting the document. That's all we've actually said. Where are we wrong? And of course, there's no response to mm. that at all. So, no. anyway, I thought we'd get a, a big boy on, a grown up, to talk to us <laughs> about it. And uh, I, I think, I mean, I'm not saying that means I'm not doing this now. Going, look, it's all done, it's all sorted off. But this is a multi year proposition. Um, it's not going to be turned around before the election. It's not going to be turned around in 2024. It's not going to be turned around maybe in 2025. Should it go that way? And we've got time to figure it out. All right, um, here's one for you that's going to drive a bunch of people mad, I'm sure. Dun, 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 dun. Hey, Chewy, what is that? Oh, this, this fucking guy. Look, before you all switch off and we see the, the live viewership go, brrr, and I'm not interested in talking about that question. I, I'm, I'm actually decided I'm going to write a piece and do a piece how to answer this question because I think um, the, 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 the conversation around the question is ridiculous. It's easily answerable. And I think many parts of the spectrum of this conversation either have it wrong or all have it partly right. And it's just, it's stupid. It's tropian. And, and, and when you give an answer, they don't accept it. So in other words, give me the answer to the question. Here's this answer. I don't accept your answer. And it goes on and on and on. But one of the things I am quite interested to think about is this quote unquote movie was released on Twitter over the weekend, right? It got, as you can see down here, this was at the last time I updated it, 175 million views. Let's refresh it, see what it comes up with. It got 176 million views. The thing I really want to understand, and maybe people, maybe people have an opinion on this. This is a little short one, and then we're going to go to our last conversation, and maybe you can, you can um, share your thoughts on this. Why is this being so popular? Like, if those numbers, 176 million views, were at the box office, and yeah, I know it's a free thing on Twitter, it's not going to be the same. The biggest movie of the weekend in America was, funnily enough, Joey, guess it? Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse. The Spider-Man. Good. Yeah. Go and watch the Spider-Man. Don't watch this trash. Fair. Um, it took in $120 million. That means it sold about 12 million tickets, right? 10 bucks ticket. Is that right? Mm. 12 times 10, 120. If this thing was a ticket based one, which it's not, it's a free thing, it would, it would be, what would that be? 12, it would be 15 times the size of this. Now, just for content received, not for money generated or anything. And I'm really interested as to why it is so popular. Is it really? Because there are just that many transphobes around the world. And they've all got only one thing to watch that's uh, anti-woke and anti-this and anti-that. But it just intrigues me as to why this subject matter and this uh, piece of, I would say celluloid in the old days because it'll be on film, what is so, so massive. And maybe people have an opinion on that. Maybe it's not a good answer to the question. Maybe there's bad reasons why. So, like, why did so many Jews die? You know, well, that's not actually a very good answer to that question, not a happy answer. Maybe it's not a happy answer. But I also think, I really believe this, is that if you're someone who finds this, this content from this guy, Matt Walsh, to be abhorrent, I think it's, you know, it's, it's know thine enemy. It's wise to figure out what's going on so you can combat it. And I want to ask the question, why is this going on in such a successful way? I'd like to try and figure it out. What, what, any thoughts, Joey? A couple of thoughts. Yeah. Um, we, we're just looking at the metrics on the YouTube video, right? Uh, Twitter. It's all on Twitter. Oh, sorry. Sorry, Twitter. Yeah. So it, it, I, I noticed Elon shared this around to his minions. Mm. Um, it's also how does it generate that? Does it come up on your feed and if it plays thirty seconds, it counts it as a view? Yeah, I'm not. I'm not one hundred percent sure on that. I can probably work that out by by doing our own uh, Twitter feeds. But because um, I mean, I, th I, I think that's th there's a danger in that to say, "Wow, one hundred and seventy million people struggled yep. through this whole thing and agree with it," is 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 a very different 
sort of thing. And I know Facebook and, and, and Twitter have been kind of pinged before for saying that their videos get such high uh, buy-in from people when they're auto-playing on people's feeds. Um, the, the other part of it is there's obviously been money spent promoting this. Oh, for you sure. Know, I, I, I see it pop up in my recommended videos, and it, it's very much outside of what I would expect in my own algorithms and that sort of thing. And sure, some of that can be rage engagement, which is great. There's nothing better for engagement than getting people good and fucked off. So, okay. you know, it, it is that. Are, are people agreeing with the message? That's more nebulous and hard to tell. Um, I hope not. I don't think that people are buying into it. Yeah, it's 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 interesting. Like like I'm I'm about understanding why people believe what they believe and and just to actually the question you asked is is brilliant i'll i'll, I'll make you laugh now Are you ready for this mm -hmm. video analytics and media studio what metric is used for the view count the main twitter video view metric is triggered when a user watches a video for at least two seconds <laughs> two seconds <laughs> what it says <laughs> and sees at least oh, 50 percent right, okay. of the video player in view this applies to view metrics for both upload videos and live broadcasts. Wow, that's tenuous. So yeah, okay. So that could be an answer. I mean, I didn't, I didn't have that before. You just suggested it, so that could be an answer. Now, wow. Uh, we, but we have to, but we also have to know. Like, I've got, I've got numbers on the people who watch our our videos. That mm. that even if that cut it by. 80% and I'm not saying that would be the number I'm just thinking about I get a graph for how many people have watched the first 25 second 25 third 25 and obviously the first 25 because of this is always the biggest number but let, let's say it cuts it in half let's say it cuts it in half you know you're still looking at 85 87 million that's still fucking huge but but the, the you just put a pretty big caveat out there to, to explain one of the reasons I mean to have his name Matt Walsh's name trending in New Zealand and all over the world, something was going on. Yeah. Maybe it was tweets like, who the fuck is Matt Walsh? Because, <laughs> I, I, I mean, honestly, that, that was the first time that they popped up on my feeds, and it was so noticeable, it was like a promoted ad on YouTube. It was a promoted tweet. It was a yeah. promoted uh, video on Facebook. I'm like, who the fuck is this guy to be throwing around so much money on such a US-centric documentary big, yep. big ear quotes there yep. um that obviously it's got some cash behind it and it sticks out and yep. and we we start talking about it i'm like ah oh, okay now it's starting to make sense it's a conservative culture war point they're getting traction on it they think it's worth pushing money into it um and, and that's what it is and and it it becomes this driving thing of the conversation right i did, did there's all of these people just asking questions you know yeah. oh, it's about but, safety in bathrooms and, and and stuff like that but not you know? but not accepting the answer to the question because it's not no, the answer they want not. Yeah, yeah absolutely not i mean i i saw a, a a thing on reddit the other day which is where this has got to so rapidly in america right you had uh, a trans person uh, aware of the changes of the law in their state. So they went to use the bathroom of their assigned gender at birth. People saw them going into that bathroom and decided that they were the other way trying to go into the bathroom and then beat the shit out of them. And yeah. then the police were called and the person that was beaten up was arrested for trying to do the things that the conservative part of the world wants them to do they cannot win the only way is not to play don't exist that's that's what they're going for yeah here's always the thing that we show when you talk about this sort of thing Joey. these people here are trans men mm. so following oh, but the you law you can always tell pat you can always tell following the law this individual Idiot. uses the women's the woman's yeah, uh, bathroom. Like if you saw that dude going into a woman's bathroom <laughs> If you were a woman and, and, and that dude comes through the door, what are you going to think? Come yeah. on. 
Yeah, no, interesting. Look, uh, and like I know that some people may not be that happy that I've brought up the, the the even the concept of talking about this, but I think it's really important. I really do believe that if you bury your head in the sand and you don't look at what's going on around you, then you won't be prepared for conversations. And I have to tell you that within that documentary, which I have watched because I watch everything, um, some people who work in some pretty highfalutin, high-profile places don't do themselves many favours by be by basically getting trapped in a corner by this guy um, and not able to answer. Well, I won't say that because they have answers, but he won't accept them and it ends up looking a bit foolish. Now, we all know that there'll be editing and stuff in there as well, but if, if you're going to participate in this world of these conversations, you do need to think these things through, even if they feel ugly to, feel, to think through at times. And I think it's important to know that this has obviously got an incredibly popular reach. And if you're someone who's going to have these conversations, you need to understand that, that this is going to be uh, common and popular to people who have the opposing view. And to uh, think through responses and conversations to them is a wise thing to do, my opinion. Anyway, it, it's so hard though, right? Because it, it, well, I, I certainly find it difficult because I am constantly on the peripherals or involved in those discussions all the time, and, and, like online and Twitter and, and Facebook and that sort of thing. And then when it bleeds through into my real life, I just don't have the bandwidth to it to do yeah. it. And I'm absolutely like, oh, I'd get fucked, you know. I don't want to debate these these tenuous ideas, these off the wall hypotheticals of what could happen, the slippery slope that doesn't exist. And, and, and do you know what was really helpful for that? That just came out recently. Alcohol. No, <laughs> uh, no. Um, okay. Spinoff uh, published a, a survey or did a, a story on a survey. Um, and this actually pairs up with a couple of things that have happened overseas as well. Similar surveys. Um, I'm going to get rid of that massive ad. There we go. Um, vast majority of New Zealanders believe trans people should be protected from discrimination. It is not even close. Scroll it it's down. I can't, we can't see the, We can't see the bottom of it. What's even the? Yeah, okay. Yeah, of course. <laughs> um, so the latest global survey from IPSOS um, shows that eighty-four percent of New Zealanders believe that transgender people should be protected from discrimination in employment, housing, and access to businesses. Of course. Um, it goes into a lot of detail. I definitely encourage people to go and um, seek this out. Maybe put um, the link in the chat, eh? For that, for yeah, that story. Ab absolutely. We'll put the chat, uh, the link in the chat for everybody. Um, the vast majority of people are not demons. <laughs> they realise that people might be a little bit different from them, and they might be in a little bit of a vulnerable position, and some people might fucking hate them for who they are. And yeah. generally in New Zealand, we don't like that. We're not fans. Yeah. And when you look at how this drills down into other countries that are similar to us, hey, it's almost exactly mirrored with what Australia thinks. Even in, in America, right? A little bit different, but still, most people think that trans people deserve to exist, deserve a bit of protection. It's, yeah, you need Perfect. a platform when we're talking about these sort of things because it is very easy to become polarized. There is only the extreme, they all deserve to die. And then the other one is everybody should be trans. Most people are going to be in the middle. Most people are fear dealing. Most people might have concerns through lack of knowledge. Those people yeah. are happy to do. Yeah, well, that's the same as when we've talked about anti-vaxxers and stuff in the past. Those people at the top who are sowing the disinformation, they're a little bit beyond saving, but the people that they're talking mm. to, the ones that they're giving bad information to, they're the ones that I want to speak to. Hey, let's just have a look quickly at some of the comments that are coming about this. Uh, a lot of the view will be bots says uh, JN. Mm -hmm. um, it's a mix of factors, says the other Paul. Uh, there's no data on how much of it was viewed, what you, what you were saying, Chewy. Uh, the conspiracy-minded share all sorts of crap on mass, and that may be counted as a view and paid promotion as a factor. Uh, Guru says it's not. 80% of US citizens in recent US poll support having the freedom to choose who you love. I guess you're saying it's not popular. Yeah. Um, uh, Free Soul says Spotify use bots to up content views. Uh, JK says, meanwhile, over in Mastodon, haven't even heard of the video. <laughs> That's a big uh, tick for Mastodon, really. <laughs> Michael says, I don't trust view data. It's all nonsense for advertising. 
Yeah. Uh, ben says, I had to spend half the damn week in debunking Walsh's crap to a fellow board member of my kid's primary school. Good man. Um, and Peter says, uh, it's just fear, rage, and hatred. Tons more messages in there, but because I haven't pre-read them, I will not get to them. Maybe we will after this. Right. We're going to wrap up. We're going to do one more story. It's a short one, though, as well. It's only a four and a half minute clip. And I want to share this because if you've lost faith in the world from our last conversation, check out this fucking 15 year old talking about the voting age. An independent electoral review has just published their draft recommendations focused on making our electoral system fairer, clearer and more accessible. A key finding is lowering the voting age to 16. For more on this long back and forth campaign, we're joined by Make It 16's Thomas Brochery. Kia ora, Thomas. Why should we lower the voting age to 16? Yeah, there are a lot of reasons that we should lower the voting age to 16. The biggest one is that, uh, that what was ruled last year in the Supreme Court case at the end of November, that it is unjustified age discrimination, that the Electoral Act, which sets the voting age out to be 18, is inconsistent with the Bill of Rights Act, which protects people above the age of 16 from age discrimination. So that's the legal argument. But then there are also a lot of other reasons. 16 makes the most sense to be the voting age right now. Of course, there is always going to be somewhat of an arbitrary line, but currently at 16 in New Zealand, you can consent to sex, you can give medical consent, you can learn how to drive, you can uh, drop out of school and work full time. So that's taxation without representation. You have all of these privileges, all of these rights afforded to you, yet you can't have a legal entrenched say in what happens in your country regarding um, who is representing you at the national level and at, even at the local level. So, yeah. <laughs> you mentioned the Supreme Court. How vindicating is it to now have this review backing that up? Yeah. Look, so it's another voice in the ever-growing chorus of calls to lower the voting age. Last year, we handed in a petition with more than 7,000 signatures, an open letter with more than 72, or I think it was exactly 72 members of local government who were uh, supporting lowering the voting age. It's another voice in the chorus of calls. But this time, it's actually commissioned by the government to... Um, make the electoral system fairer. So it'd be very odd, to say the least, if they didn't listen to that review that they commissioned and they paid for. What's the argument that's most often levelled against the 16 campaign, Make It 16 campaign, Thomas? Mm. So there are, unfortunately, a number of misconceptions. Probably the largest one is that 16, 17-year-olds aren't mature enough, and that's incorrect. <laughs> uh, so the argument for maturity comes down to just harmful stereotypes about young people in general. And for young people, it also comes down to brain development. People say that people, young 16, 17 year olds brains aren't developed enough, that they can't make informed decisions. And if that argument was valid, then really you should set the voting age to 25. But the way it works is that you can make informed decisions, or that in, those informed decisions that you take time to research, that you take time to think about and hear other people's views, those aren't um, hindered very much by uh, your age at 16 compared to 25. So, yeah, and voting falls into one of those categories as it's not something that you're given on the spot. You don't hop into the booth first time, first thing you wake up and tick a random box. It is a drawn out process. You do research, you do give time to think about it. And 16 and 17 year olds can do that. How old are you, Thomas? I'm 15 right now. You're 15. I I'd put it to you that not many 15 year olds are probably as mature, as articulate as you are. You would probably be in the minority in terms of those wanting to be actively involved in this process. Do you think that's fair? Uh, well, look, I'm absolutely flattered by your words, but I think in our current <laughs> society, in our interconnected society with so much communication on social media and all of these issues, young people are generally aware of these issues. They do care about them, even if they aren't uh, going to hop on an interview and discuss them. So, yeah, it is a, quite a large um, portion of uh, young people are worried about these issues and do want to vote to express their beliefs. Do you think 15 year olds, 16 year olds would surprise the rest of the country with their turnout and come out in force in ele at an election? Mm. People very often say that 16 and 17 year olds wouldn't vote, that there'd be very low turnout, and that's actually not true. Um, in Scotland, for example, where they lowered the voting age to 16, there was quite high turnout amongst 16 and 17 year olds. So there is quite a um, quite a good market, I suppose, of 16 and 17 year olds who would vote and would raise turnout, especially in local elections where turnout is currently so abysmal. And yeah, so that'd be go a long way to improving turnout in both local and general elections. So there you go. Chewy, I mean, I know last week you threw your hands up after Chloe Warbrick spoke and went, Kowain, what would you say about him? King. 
Great. <laughs> uh, look, mark his name down because we'll be hearing from him, I'm sure, in, in years to come. Like, if, if there isn't a party sort of going, we need to get him into a young MP pro <laughs> program, right the fuck now. Um, I, I had a discussion about this with, with a couple of um, colleagues today, and, and, and one of them said, no, nah, we shouldn't lower it to 16 because kids are dumb. Um, and, and I just snapped back him and, and said, if, if people being dumb was a barrier to people <laughs> vote, like, I got news for you, man. <laughs> There's lots of dumb people that vote, lots of uninformed voters that vote. Adding more voices to democracy cannot hurt it. Um, let's have a can, look. Can you think about just just from look at where politicians are doing their meet and greets, right? They're doing them at bowling clubs to retire, yeah. because yeah. That, that's the you know does a conversation shift if they're fronting a a school auditorium looking for votes? And yes, also, the decisions made today other things that will be impacting for the next 10, 20, 30, yes. 40 years. I just want to also have a look. This is the actual information around the review because obviously part of it was lowering to 16. There were some other recommendations as well. Let me read them out to you. Lowering the voting age for general elections to 16 and extend overseas voting rules. Extending voting rights to all prisoners, not just those one sentenced to less than three-year jail term. Holding a referendum on extending the parliamentary term from three to four years. Lowering the party vote threshold from 5 to 3.5% and abolishing the coattail rule. Uh, for clarity, I know most of my uh, smart listeners will know this, but the coattail rule is one person gets a seat and can drag someone in back with them, like on the coattail, which is what ACT has done when they didn't get 5%. They would bring in more MPs on their 3% re uh, response, return. Restricting political donations to registered voters rather than organisations and capping them at $30,000 to each party and its candidates per election cycle while reducing the amount that can be anonymously donated. Rewriting the Electoral Act to modernise its language, uh, e.g. eliminating references to faxes <laughs> and carrier pigeons, uh, and requiring the Electoral Commission to give effect to the Treaty of Waitangi. There are the recommendations in there. And um, yeah, we've just heard one uh, particular angle to do with lowering the voting. Look, I, I've said this the whole way, completely support lowering the voting age to 16, but it's not going to happen at the moment because it needs 75% majority. Now, what can happen is we can say to those politicians who would vote against it, <coughs> National Act, um, that what you're doing is denying these people civil rights, as has been represented in the court mm -hmm. system now and recommended by the electoral uh, you know, uh, group, the, whatever their official name is, the electoral, uh, I've forgotten their name, anyway, you know, the, the review from the electoral group. So it's a way that we can actually then put pressure on them to then do it. But at the moment, because it needs 75% majority, it's not, it's just not going to happen. But that's fodder for, well, if you guys are allowed to ignore what's been ruled as the, the rights of these people, then we can ignore other rights, can't we? Like, for example, the right to go into a store when you uh, haven't had your vaccine. We can ignore that right if you can ignore the right of these 16-year-olds to have the vote. Hmm. Just a thought. Yeah. The 75% the, the hmm. rule just pisses me off. It, it's just, it entrenches inertia. Well, but, I mean, I to be honest with you, bro, I, I think it pisses me off when it's things I like, and I love it when it's things I don't like, which is pretty well, much that's, why, why they've got it. So, you know, we... Fair. Well, we can't we <laughs> can't say me. we can't say it pisses us off and then for example have you know a political party in with some other kind of electoral change let like let, let's make it nine percent and they can pass it on 51 percent and that means all that's in now is labor act and national they're the only parties that can and let's get but, rid of the maori seats you know you can't, you can't all you've got to do is, is is convince the libertarian party right mm -hmm. then everything goes they they they, uh, they believe in in representation, don't they? Yep, with taxation or something. Anyway. Well, they don't think they like tax, but but yeah, I I mean the the arguments were, were so good. Like all of those recommendations, I agree with. Like they they're all good. As much as I'm holding my nose and going, yeah, but what if National get in for four years? Um, also, what I, if I, what 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 if some, what if the Outdoors and Freedom Party get in on three point five one percent? That's the only thing I think about. Yeah, but I mean, we see that in, in other MMP 
um, governments around the world, they, they use about three and a half percent. It's fine. Like, again, it, it's representative. representative. Do, have um, you heard that Leighton Baker has started a party? The Leighton Baker party. And it's called the Leighton, Leighton Baker, Baker party. Featuring Leighton Baker. Fantastic. Um, it's, it's going to split that terrible. vote more and more and more. And I support you 100%, Leighton Baker. You should absolutely make sure that 5% of the vote goes off to the conspiracy theorists and you all get about 1% each. Mwah. Perfect work, yep. sir. Well done. Yeah, no, I, I love it. Like the, the, the absolute just the, the worms. His, his, his head is full of worms. Um, yeah, I, I think they're all good change. Like the, the changing to four year term, right? It, it always seems to me that a government spends a year getting its shit together, a mm. year doing something, and then a year campaigning <laughs> or, or fucking up the campaign as we're seeing uh, at the moment. Um, so maybe a, like a, a four year term just makes sense to me. Yeah, as long as it's not on the same cycle as fucking America. You don't want to have two elections every time with that. Oh, Do it on Christ. sort it out so it's on the on the off an off year or the off season or whatever. Hey team, yeah. it's been um it's been fun tonight. Thank you for joining us. Big thanks to our uh patrons as well. Uh also as you can see scrolling along the bottom of the um screen there, uh subscribing to our daily audio podcast on Apple Podcasts. Uh, Spotify and Google Podcasts. If you have the option, I, if you can pick any one of those three things, we would appreciate you signing up on Apple Podcasts because uh, they have official charts which make a difference to us. They make a difference to us because the further we are up the charts, the more access we get to people because it brings credibility. Uh, and if you're like me, I mean, I listen to our own podcast sometimes on Apple Podcasts, put it on the background, help us get up the charts there. It's a way that you can support us as uh, along with uh, becoming a patron patreon.com forward slash big hearing news thanks to all our patrons and uh it's been a it's been a good one it's been a been a long one but this often happens when we have a um have a night off chewy we've got too much to talk about tomorrow night we will be showing you uh simon wilson off the top rope with the uh the 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 people's the elbow steel chair. Um, against uh david seymour and i'm sure there'll be more in the news as is always the case for us to be talking about cool bananas Sounds sounds like a an adequately chilled banana. That's my uh, sign off. Often on uh, on my when I do a tweet, I do the the the, the smiley face with the dark glasses, cool, and a banana. Mm. I don't know if you've ever received that sign off from me, Chewy, but cool bananas. That's my sign. I off have on, not on my Twitter. Um, <laughs> all right, sir. Anything you want to leave us with? No, no, that's everything. You have been a beautiful you team. Go tonight. about your evenings. And look, we got out of here well before one AM. We thought it was going to be one AM. It's so well, be it's only like Just quarter a to one AM. Lean show, a lean show. Uh, we'll see you tomorrow night. Now, it doesn't you don't need to know this now, but there, I don't think there'll be a show next Wednesday night unless you want to do it, Chewy. Um, I won't be here. I'll be out at dinner with my children. Um, but uh, this Sorry, week we're here. Wednesday. I wasn't listening. Next Wednesday. Wednesday week. Next Wednesday. Yeah. Um, uh, actually, I think that is rather convenient because. Yes, I will not be here either. So uh, no show next Wednesday. Agreed. We'll try and put something together for you. Um, it's my birthday night, and so I'm going out with the kids. And, uh, yeah, but this week we've got three. Next week we've got three, and we will keep the uh, content coming, and you guys keep sharing it, and we'll all take over the world together, and Chewy will sniff into the microphone as we wrap up the show because it's perfect. <laughs> I haven't belched. I don't belch into the microphone, which is uh. entirely you. All right. Disgusting. Thanks, Dave. We'll catch you tomorrow night from uh, 9 p.m. for another one. Who wrote?